Eli Stutzman had spent his entire life lying. Lying about his sexual orientation, lying about how his wife died, lying about where his son was, and lying about how Glenn Pritchett died. As he dug a deeper and deeper hole in order to maintain his lifestyle, bodies would continue to turn up around him. This is Monsters. Previously on This is Monsters, Eli Stusman was raised in the Swartz and Truber Amish community, he left the church, then he went back and got married. After having a son, Danny, his pregnant wife died in a barn fire and people suspected Eli had murdered her. He took Danny and left the church again, living in Colorado and partying in the gay scene. Then he moved to Austin where his roommate, Glenn Pritchett, was found dead in a ditch. All evidence led to Eli as the killer, but he had packed up and fled the area. If you haven't listened to part one, Barn Fires and Bodies, go back and give that a listen before you start this episode. Otherwise, here's the exciting conclusion of the story of Eli Stutzman. On June 16, 1985, Eli Stutzman flipped on the light in his roommate's bedroom. He asked to borrow some luggage and explained that his lawyer had advised him to get out of town. It immediately seemed odd that someone's lawyer would advise them to flee a homicide investigation. Eli grabbed his roomie's bags and started filling them up with clothes. The roommate noticed that Danny wasn't in the house, and when he asked where he was, Eli said he was with friends. The roommate drove Eli to an empty parking lot in a rural part of the city. Eli got out of the car and walked off, loaded down with multiple bags. Eli's truck wasn't anywhere in the lot, and there wasn't anyone waiting to pick him up. The following morning, the roommate went over the confusing event in his head. He went to Danny's room to see if his clothes had been packed up, but they were all still in their place. Eli spent some time with friends in New Mexico before traveling by bus to Wyoming, where he had asked some friends to look after Danny. Dean Barlow had met Eli at a Halloween party in Durango a few years prior. Eli and Danny had then traveled to Wyoming to spend the following Christmas with Dean and his wife Margie. The couple owned a daycare in their small town of Lyman. Eli signed paperwork to make them Danny's legal guardians and told them that one of his employees had been murdered in Austin and he was going to track down the killer himself. When Eli left Wyoming, you probably won't be surprised to find out he didn't do anything to track down a killer. He just traveled around and visited his friends. While visiting, he continued to tell everyone he knew about the murder in Texas. He blabbed about the crime all the time, even telling people that whoever killed Glenn had used his 22 caliber rifle. He would constantly add details to the story that weren't true and were often unbelievable, which just made people more suspicious. He spent time at a friend's farm in Indiana, where the friend said in a later interview that he didn't believe Eli's story. He was sure that a murderer was staying at his farm. While there, the friend said that Eli got calls and even mail from strange people and he believed that Eli was meeting men through classified ads and using his home as a base of operation. When Eli finally left Indiana, he went to Ohio where he was able to get a new driver's license and social security card using a different middle initial and birth date. Then he went back to New Mexico where he began working and living on a farm in Aztec. In October of 1985, Dean Barlow dropped Danny off with Eli in New Mexico while he was on his way to a poultry show. The plan was for Danny to stay with his father permanently, but Eli already knew that that wouldn't work for him. While Dean was on his way back from Wyoming, Eli told him that the farm wasn't a good place for Danny. The farm owner had a drinking problem and he thought that he should go back to Wyoming. The entire time that Eli was living his life child-free, he was sending letters to Ida's family as if Danny was with him. He even forged one letter as if it was written by Danny himself. Aztec, New Mexico was only a 45-minute drive to Durango. So Eli began going back to his old stomping grounds to party with friends. At the beginning of November, Eli was fired from the farm for inappropriate behavior. Others who lived there said Eli walked around naked, and one person said they caught him masturbating in front of his son during the time that Danny had been there. Eli moved to a different farm where the owner had a number of guns, and he tended to leave them lying around the farmhouse. On November 10th, a passenger train was coming into Durango when a passenger saw a body in the back of a pickup truck outside of the automatic transmission exchange. Authorities identified the body as that of 36-year-old David Tyler one of the owners of the transmission shop. He had been bludgeoned to death. 
David had lived in Durango for about three years, and people who knew him said that he was a laid-back person who occasionally used drugs. They said he wasn't a frequent partier, but the last time he was seen was at a gay party at a nearby Holiday Inn on November 8th. Authorities found David's vehicle in the hotel parking lot, but not much else in the way of evidence. On December 5th, 24-year-old Dennis Slater was found shot to death in the basement of Junction Creek Liquors, where he worked as a clerk. Dennis was about to graduate from Fort Lewis College and had been working at the liquor store part-time. Authorities said that money was missing from the register. On November 29th, Eli had put $300 down on a 1975 AMC Gremlin at a nearby auto dealership. One week later, just after the liquor store was robbed and Dennis was murdered, Eli went back to the dealer and paid another $300 in order to take the car. Not long after the discovery of Dennis's body, Eli's roommate had noticed that two of his rifles were missing. He asked Eli about them, but the man who had convinced his roommate that he was a good, honest Amishman denied ever touching the guns. Of course, that was a lie. On December 10th, Eli sold the rifles to a local pawn shop for $210. He grabbed the cash, packed his car, and fled the area, headed toward Wyoming. He was on his way to pick up Danny, but he clearly wasn't planning to keep Danny with him. The day he left Durango, he mailed a letter to a Missouri farmer that he had met through a personal ad. They had been corresponding for a few months and had made plans for Eli to visit his farm for Christmas. In the letter, he let the man know that Danny might not be with him when he arrived. He explained that the boy wanted to spend Christmas with other family members. At 10 o'clock in the morning on December 24, 1985, Chuck Cleveland decided to go out and get a haircut and do some pheasant hunting. He grabbed his shotgun and fired up his Red Ford pickup heading into the town of Chester, Nebraska. As he drove, he scanned the fields for any sign of pheasants feeding on stray grains. He wasn't able to find any fowl, but something blue caught his eye on the side of the road. Chuck stopped his truck and got out to investigate what he had seen. As he got closer, he could see a small body wearing a blue sleeper covered in ice. It was a dead child. Chuck reached into his truck and used his CB radio to call someone at the truck stop he owned in town. He let them know he had found a body and to notify the sheriff. Sheriff Gary Young picked up the coroner on his way out to the crime scene. There had been at least three inches of snow a few days ago, but it had mostly melted by this point. The child was laid out in the field, legs spread apart, one hand on his stomach and the other behind his back. The skin on the front of his face was missing, leaving nose cartilage visible. There were bruises on his forehead and neck. When investigators from the state patrol arrived, they noted that the blue sleeper was void of any wear. It looked brand new. When the boy was finally picked up and placed into a body bag, no evidence was found underneath. It was as if the body just dropped out of the sky. There were tire tracks nearby which were photographed, but authorities weren't hopeful that they lead to their killer. The body was found off of the main highway through town, which was a well-traveled road. The body was sent to Lincoln for autopsy, but first had to thaw, which took about a day and a half. The boy was determined to have been in good health and well-fed. The coroner documented the missing pieces of the boy's face, which were clearly caused by wild animals after the body was dumped. It was when the coroner looked at the skull and found no injuries that the investigators became confused. What about the bruises on the forehead? The coroner explained that skin can discolor in extremely cold temperatures. It would turn out that that was the reason for the bruising on the neck as well. There was no hemorrhaging in the boy's neck muscles and no damage to his hyoid bone. Not only did they not know who this boy was, but they had no idea how he died. Detectives continued investigating under the assumption that the boy had been murdered. Dumping a body is usually a pretty good sign that the person was murdered. It was still possible that the little boy had been suffocated. Eventually, another medical examiner would determine that it was possible the boy died from rapid freezing. During the initial autopsy, the boy's anus was dilated, which led investigators to believe he may have been sexually assaulted. A rape kit came back negative, and there was no signs that anything else had been inserted into the boy's rectum. Anal dilation is something that can be caused by rapid freezing along with the discolorization on the boy's head and neck. It was possible that the boy was unconscious but still alive when he was placed on the side of the road. But the temperature outside was so cold that the boy would have frozen very quickly. None of the local authorities knew who the child was and there were no missing persons who matched the profile. A composite sketch was made of what the boy probably looked like before animals and made a snack of his face. 
Flyers were made and posted across the state, and then the country. The same day the body was discovered, a mentally ill woman who was not a local was picked up for causing a disturbance at a cafe in town. She had even blurted out that she had killed someone, but after checking her out, she was eliminated as a suspect. Tips came in from all over the country, Montana, California, Kansas, Florida, Georgia, Canada, Mexico, but they never led them any closer to finding out the identity of who they had grown to call Little Boy Blue. As lead after lead ended in dead ends, authorities became more motivated to identify the boy. Stories were written up in USA Today and People magazine. As 1986 passed them by, Little Boy Blue would remain nameless. December of 1985 was a busy month for Eli. He visited two men he had met through personal ads. He told both of them that Danny had stayed with other family members for Christmas. He told them that he had lost his ranch after his lover died in a car accident, and of course he was still talking about Glenn Pritchett's death. By this time, he was also telling the men he would meet that he had recently had a negative AIDS test, something that was not true. Eli went to Ohio and stayed with friends for Christmas. He visited family in the area and now was telling people that Danny was in ski competitions and had won some races. At this point, it seemed that everything that Eli said was a lie. He had two lives, the one he really lived and the one people thought he lived. By February of 1986, Eli had moved to Azle, Texas, just southwest of Fort Worth. It was in April that Eli broke the news that Danny had died for the first time. He told a friend that Danny had died in a car accident in Salt Lake City. He claimed that the Barlows had been hit by a truck and that Danny suffered massive head injuries. Also in April, Eli sent a letter to the Gingriches claiming that Danny was happy, enjoying school, and was in a soccer program. It wasn't until July 30th, 1986, that the Gingriches finally received word that Danny had died. Eli wrote them a letter explaining that Danny had been in a car accident with the Barlows and had died. He claimed that he had sent them a letter sooner so they could attend the funeral, but it was returned to him. This was an obvious lie to explain why they had missed the funeral, which had never really happened. One Hand Eli and Susan Stutzman also received a letter. Amos Gingrich, Ida's father, wasn't convinced by the letter. Eli had lied enough to lose all of his credibility with the elder Amishman. Amos and a friend tried to track down the cemetery where Danny was supposedly buried, but had no luck. Then they boarded a bus to Lyman, Wyoming, to seek out the Barlows. Once in Lyman, they contacted the local police, who said they had no record of an accident involving Danny or the Barlows. Then the police brought Dean and Margie Barlow to the police station, where Amos had them read the letter he had received from Eli. Nothing in the letter was true, and the Barlows were just as confused as the Gingriches. After returning home, they continued trying to get answers, but only hit dead ends. The December 1987 edition of Reader's Digest featured an article titled Little Boy Blue of Chester, Nebraska. Soon, everyone in the country knew the story of the unidentified boy who was found on the side of the road two years prior. Even though they knew that Eli had lied about Denny dying in a car accident with them, the Barlows were in denial that he would do anything to hurt his child. They read the article in Reader's Digest and knew the body looked similar to Danny, but they found ways to convince themselves otherwise. Chester wasn't really on the way between Wyoming and Ohio, and they should have been pretty far past that point by the time of the boy's estimated time of death. Still, the idea was eating at her, so Margie wrote a letter to the Chester police and included a picture of Danny. When investigators got the letter, they immediately knew that they finally had an identity for the boy. Now, all they needed to do was find his father. When investigators dug into Eli's life, they found that he had two different IDs, each with a different middle initial, date of birth, and social security number. They learned of his wife's death, his various moves around the country, and that his roommate had been killed and dumped in a ditch. Once they heard that someone else that knew Eli had been dumped in a ditch, they knew they were on the right track. Eli had allowed the ranch in Durango to go into foreclosure, so ownership returned to the person he bought it from. The court determined that the original owner owed some money back to Eli, so he had been making $400 monthly payments to Eli since June of 1987. He was mailing them to an address in Azle, Texas. Authorities contacted the police chief of Azle and let him know that they were looking for a man in his town. 
Chief Ted Garber looked up records on Eli Stutzman and found out that there were two. One had reported a burglary in October, and the other had reported their truck stolen in November. By the time he went out to the house listed on the reports, Eli had moved out. Through investigative work, Chief Garber narrowed down the area where Eli might be living now and spent some time just driving around looking for his blue pickup truck. It had been recovered only a few days after it was reported stolen. As luck would have it, in an old trailer park in the north end of the county, Garber found Eli's truck. After confirming the license plate, he called for backup where they watched the house until morning. On December 14, 1987, Eli Stutzman was arrested and charged with felony child abuse. When Eli was arrested, there was no pictures of Danny on him. He had his fake ID and social security card and a few business cards. He was taken to the Azel police station where he was interviewed by Chief Garber. Garber first asked him about his wife's death. Eli told him the same story he'd been telling for the last decade. Lightning strike, barn caught fire, Ida died trying to get milk pails. You know, the chief didn't buy it. Next, he asked about Glenn Pritchett. Eli explained that detectives had questioned him because his gun was used in the murder. He said that he had been woken up in the middle of the night by an argument in his living room. He suddenly heard a gunshot, and after a while, things got quiet. When he went to the living room to check it out, everyone was gone. He didn't know exactly who had been there. If this was true, why wouldn't he tell police that when they came to his house asking about Glenn? Why would he make up a story about taking Glenn to the bus station? There's literally only one reason you make up a story to explain away someone's disappearance, and that's because you were involved in it. And police did not question him because his gun was used. They didn't even know he had guns until they questioned him. When Garber asked him why he left Austin the day after police questioned him, Eli couldn't give him an answer. Apparently, he had abandoned the story about his lawyer telling him to get out of town, probably because he knew the experienced cop would know it was bullshit. Finally, the chief asked him about Danny. Eli claimed that when he picked up Danny from the Barlows, he was sick and they had given him some medication to take with him. As they traveled, Danny got worse and wouldn't eat. They stopped at a truck stop in Salina, Kansas, but Danny didn't eat much. Eli changed Danny into the blue pajamas and the boy curled up in a blanket in the back of the gremlin and slept. At some point, Eli noticed that his son's eyes had rolled into the back of his head. He decided to stop and leave Danny somewhere, quote, where God could find him, end quote. It's interesting that the place he felt that God could find him was also a place where people wouldn't. He could have dropped him off at a hospital or a fire station, but no, the side of a desolate road was the best place for God to find him, of course. And how did he get to Chester? He was coming from Lyman, Wyoming, which was in the southwest corner of the state. The best way to get to Salina, Kansas, was to drop down from the I-80, from Cheyenne to Denver, and then head east on the I-70. But he would have no reason to do that if he was headed back to Ohio. This was because Eli was actually headed to Salina to stay with a man he had met in a classified ad. Now, if Eli stayed on the I-80 past Cheyenne, it would have taken him through Nebraska, and if he got off I-80 and headed south on Highway 81 for about an hour, he'd be in Chester. Another hour and 20 minutes south was Selena. Eli arrived at his friend's house in Selena at about 7 a.m. on December 15, 1985. He must have placed Danny's body on the side of the road just hours before. When Garber asked Eli where he went after he put Danny on the side of the road, he lied and said he went to Ohio. We know that's not true because he went to Selena and spent time with one man and then went to Missouri and spent time with another man. The second man he had written to and told him that Danny might not be with him when he arrived. He wrote that letter before he had picked up Danny from the Barlows, showing that he was already planning to kill the boy. During their background investigation of Eli, it was discovered that he had tested positive for HIV. Not only was he directly murdering people, he was risking countless other lives by claiming he had tested negative. Eli was extradited to Nebraska so he could stay on trial there. When he was booked into the county jail, he requested Grecian formula so his hair would stay nice. Authorities couldn't find any evidence that proved Eli caused Danny's death. They eventually let him plead to two misdemeanors, abandoning a body and concealing a death. He was sentenced to 18 months for the crimes, but that would not be the end of Eli's time behind bars. After Eli completed his sentence in Nebraska, he was sent back to Texas to stand trial for the murder of Glenn Pritchett. 
the jury found him guilty and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. While in prison, he wrote to his family members and some kept up correspondence in hopes that he would eventually confess to his other crimes. He would only continue to claim his innocence. He wrote to one friend that he was fighting to find out how his son actually died and that five other children had died in Wyoming from an unknown disease. That was a lie. At the same time, investigators were trying to gather evidence that he had murdered both David Tyler and Dennis Slater in Durango. Dennis had died just days before Eli left town, which had become a pattern for the man. Detectives tried to compare fingerprints that were already on file, but they weren't clear enough to make a good comparison. They asked Eli for new fingerprints and DNA samples, but he refused, something he shouldn't have been able to do while in prison. Even if he was able to deny giving up his DNA, the prison should have updated his fingerprint records, especially if they found out the ones they had on file were not of usable quality. Less than 13 years later, in 2002, Eli was released on parole. He found an apartment in the Fort Worth area and made a living by selling handcrafted leather goods. He had apparently learned the trade in prison. He made leather purses and Bible covers. Never one to shy away from a good lie, Eli told neighbors that he had done time in prison for drugs. He admitted to a few people that it was for murder, but maintained his innocence. He told most people that he had never been married or had children, but he did tell one neighbor that he was a widower and he left his son with his family when he left the church because he was gay. Eli made it another five years, spending most of his time in his one-bedroom apartment smoking crack before he would cause another death. This time, it would be his own. In January of 2007, Eli's landlord confronted him about his most recent rent check having bounced. Eli reached into his mind and pulled out yet another lie and told his landlord that someone had stolen his checkbook and drained his account. He explained that he would get him his rent as soon as possible. Eli had no intention of paying his rent. Near the end of January, Eli Stutzman cut his left arm open, laid down on the couch, covered himself with a comforter, and watched television until he died. A friend who hadn't heard from him in days called the police for a welfare check and his body was discovered. An autopsy and evidence at the scene determined that there was no foul play involved and the death was ruled a suicide. Many are upset that four out of the five victims that are believed to be Eli's will never get justice. Some also believe that if the authorities had done an investigation into the barn fire in 1977, it would have been clear that Eli murdered Ida and their unborn child and he would have possibly not had the chance to murder anyone else. Eli Stutzman got away with his crimes because he exploited two worlds on the opposite end of the lifestyle spectrum. He played up his Amish naivety of the outside world, making people believe that he was too sweet and simple to hurt anyone. He also committed his crimes surrounded by people in the gay community who were too afraid to come forward and have their sexual orientation questioned. We may never know the true extent of Eli Stutzman's crimes, but he will be remembered as someone that lived and died as a monster. If you want to learn more about Eli Stutzman, you can read the book Abandoned Prayers by Greg Olson. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.